Good afternoon. This is Rick Roman from EEAP sitting with Michael Crawley. We're ready to go again with another presentation and uh, help you with your safety there at your company. So uh, let's go ahead and get started here if we would. And we are talking this month about forklift safety. Forklift safety, the greatest thing in the world, Rick, forklift safety. A lot of people die from forklifts every year, don't they, Rick? They do, and, you know, a lot of our webinars are, are really geared towards management, and we thought this time that we would do one that you could actually use as a training for your yep. employees uh, to, to really help hammer home some of the things that are, that are important when it comes to forklift safety. So... As an overview, um, we're going to be going over inspections and maintenance, driver safety, uh, load handling, pedestrian safety, and training and certification for your employees. Not bad, Rick. Not bad. Anything good happening today? Yes, sir, Michael. Why don't you let them know? Today, we're giving away a free Green Mountain Grill smoker because we love you just as a customer appreciation. We'll be asking the magic question down the road here, and if you pay attention to the webinar, you can call in and give us that answer. Rick, let's move on. Let's move on. Inspections, Rick. Inspections. All right. So the first part of obviously having safe forklift operations is making sure that your forklift is operable and uh, running well and that things are going to be safe for your employees there. So the important thing is, is that forklifts must be inspected at the beginning of every shift. So um, these following things are things that you want to have visually inspected. You should have some sort of... Uh, Inspection, a checklist. A checklist. Which we do have, Rick, for the tires. We do have. Got to check the tires, Rick, to make sure that they are intact, that they're not massive, massive chunks out of them and stuff like that. Yep, and then your, your horn and your brakes, your steering, your coupling system, uh, the lift, exhaust, fuel, battery, propane, if, if it's running off of that, or gas system leaks, and there's a multitude of other things that might be on your very for your various right, lift. right. And this inspection doesn't need to be seven hours, Rick. What do you think an inspection like this should take when you're doing your forklift inspection? Probably no more than five to ten minutes. Really. I would agree with. You. I mean, you're just eyeballing this stuff. Um, you're doing this stuff pretty regularly, so chances are most of the stuff, you're catching things at yep. the early stage, and, and and that's one of the benefits also to doing these inspections is that as you're doing these, not only are you making sure that it's safe and operable for the operator, but you're also, from a maintenance yep. standpoint, you're, you're catching these things before they completely break down on you. And when you're doing the inspection, you really want to raise those forks all the way up and adjust them to the far extent so that you can make sure that everything works properly. When it comes to the brakes, you want to make sure you have a clear area and test the brakes. Make sure they're stopping appropriately and things like that. Exactly. So. And the horn. Don't forget a good horn honk. I love a good horn honk. Yes, the horn. So let's move on here. Some other things that you need to inspect that are Holy more macro. important towards Man. OSHA compliance, actually, here, Michael. Talk about these things in the pictures. Well, you first here. let me just say, if your seat looks like this, you got to replace the seat. One of the things that is always difficult is your guys in the shop, or you may be the guy in the shop, you're putting things in your back pockets, screwdriver, a cutter, or whatever, and you're tearing these seats, and they just do not last. That seat itself must be in condition so that it doesn't prevent a distraction or prevent the, the operator from uh, operating the forklift properly. If the forklift seat looked like that in the picture, you've got to replace that seat. And then you just got to go through it. If your people keep cutting it, I just don't know what to tell you. When it comes to the other thing, the seat belts, you got to make sure you are installing seat belts in your forklift. That's right. There is no grandfathering in of seat belts onto a forklift. You've got to make sure you have seat belts. Yep. If they're not already on there, then you got to retrofit them on there. And then the, obviously the key point of that is, is that you got to make sure your guys, or if you are the operator, that you're wearing your seat belt when you're operating yeah. the forklift yes. at all times. Rick, at all times is the proper word. What's funny about that is people kind of get the idea that if they're not wearing their seat belt, if they're only going to use the forklift for a couple minutes, they don't need their seat belt. It's crazy. You must have your seat belt on. A little while ago, let me tell you about the sticker. The sticker down here, a little while ago, we created these, and uh, we sell them on our sticker store, and we were giving out free samples. You may already have one of these on your forklift. But when you're looking at your forklift, usually there is a steel plate on the forklift. Right, Rick? Right. This steel plate sits, it's, it's about yay big, and it has all of the numbers on the forklift, the maximum weight and all that. 
in the Calosha code, you've got to place that, that a sticker or a, a sign, if you will, saying what the maximum load of the forklift is. Now, it's already on that plate, but you've got to do another one where the forklift operator can see it. In California, they don't think anybody's looking at the plates. So you've got to either put this on the mask or the roll cage side where the operator enters and exits so they can clearly see that's coming in. You can use the sticker. You can use whiteout. you could just got to put something on the roll cage where it says max load blah, whatever it is, 35, 45, 55, 100 pounds, whatever this forklift does, you have got to have that on there. So do not forget, if you need a sticker, great. If you don't want the sticker, you want to do it yourself, fine. That's fine, too. Either way. All right. So when it comes to the maintenance end, obviously most things that you would have to have repaired, if you have a maintenance guy in the house that you can there in the shop can do it, or if you have to hire it out to someone to come in, that's great. But minor things... The employees can be trained to do um, adding oil and water, uh, checking battery fluid, possibly if that's something that you're comfortable with, um, and being able to change the the propane fuel tanks. Those minor things your guys can be trained on, but the major repairs you really want to leave to the professionals. You know there is a lot of major repairs that can do a forklift. I agree with you, Rick. Unless you have a phenomenal maintenance shop with the equipment to be able to do this, raising the forklift up to get underneath it, if that's a trick, you really want to leave that to the to the big boys over there. But in the case that you are doing maintenance, please have maintenance records done. You want to be able to show when yes. you did things on those, and that's easy. You just put that in house put up some sort of spreadsheet and you can make those maintenance records in house. And and records of that of those repairs are also being done on those inspection sheets because yep. when your guys when you when you put something out of service mm -hmm. then once the repair has been done and it's signed off then people know that they can operate that unit again. And make sure when you are using the maintenance that you do have your safety glasses on. I notice in this picture we don't have the safety glasses, no big deal, but always nice to have some safety glasses. That's right. <laughs> okay. So now let's get into actual driver safety. Good night. Yes. So, you know, there's a lot a lot of different aspects what comes to the operation of, of the just the actual equipment itself to just your surroundings and the materials yep. and and right now we're, you know, we want to talk about just actually driving the unit and uh, you know, making sure that you're doing things like sounding the horn when you're entering into blind corners mm -hmm. or aisles where you know where visibility is limited and you want to make sure that people know that you're coming so it, it's it's good to to honk your horn same thing when you're backing up uh, if there's not a backup alarm uh, you put you, one on yes it, you you might not have that and so you would want to use that in that case um, Obviously, you don't want to be using your cell phone when you're operating a forklift because you want to be paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, move slowly through the areas where there's traffic, and you got to really pay attention to to your surroundings, especially if it's pedestrian traffic. Um, you don't want to move forward if, until you know that you have a clear view of travel, and if you have to have a spotter, then you do that. You don't allow riders unless there are some forklifts. You don't see too many forklifts, Michael, with passenger seats. But no, you it, don't really, Rick. It really doesn't. A passenger. Seat. I'm not sure you want to have a party in a forklift as you're driving. It. Exactly. But it does say here that you don't want to have. Uh, you know, you don't want to have a rider on there unless there's a seat there for him. People get so lackadaisy with working around a forklift, Rick, when it comes to where they stand. You'll see in the top picture that there is an employee or somebody that is standing directly behind the forklift as assuming the forklift is backing up. This is insane. You never know what's going to happen. The driver could miscalculate, his, his, his foot pressures a little too hard, slips off the brake, something. But these things are not forgiving to the body and feet at all. And so you really want to make sure you're standing off to the side of the forklift. And when I say off to the side, I'm not talking like two feet from the side of the driver. I'm talking a good six to seven feet, something that when that forklift swings, you're not going to get hit by the forklift. I cannot tell you how many Kalosha cases we do that a supervisor gets his toes ran over by the forklift yes. because he's standing right beside it trying to educate somebody what to do. And this guy turns the wheel, gasses it, and he doesn't either know it's turned or he's turning it, and that thing swings and crushes the toes of the of the supervisor. And that is just a terrible Kalosha defense case to be able to handle. In addition to the guys losing his toes, let's be honest. That's and that crazy. happens more often than you would think. Yeah. I, I I ran uh, dock operations for about 10 years, and uh, 
shockingly, it did happen more Happens. than you would think. So when you walk up to a forklift, you should be very, very slow to stand right back at, and, and to speak to this man in where you could shake hands. Keep it back. The bottom of the for picture you'll see there, the gentleman is kind of standing in front of the load, and that is something that is also dangerous. The employer, the employee driving the forklift may not have the distance necessary or the judgment call to know how close he's going to get or how close you are, and once again, very terrible thing to get caught in between. You do not want to get nailed by a forklift. Exactly. And then probably one of the most important things here at the bottom there, it says never allow anyone to stand or pass under the load or lifting mechanism. Right. That is a golden rule. You do not want to stand under those blades. Those things can fail or the load can shift and you don't want to be there, Rick. Exactly. If the hydraulics go out, that stuff drops fast. And then, like you said, the load shifts. It's just a dangerous place to stand. Well, I, I can't disagree with you, Rick. you got to make sure that you're standing clear of the forklifts. And, and I think having some sort of review on this regularly is, is, is important so your people can see that you're really talking about this. Please, please, please implement these things. So loading safety. Uh, you want to make sure that... Michael mentioned about the the load capacity. You you want you know you want to be aware of what that load capacity is and and make sure that you're you know lifting things that are not going to cause the forklift to tip over. Um, you want to make sure that when you're picking up anything that you're moving squarely into position straight in front of the load and getting your blades in there and having the blades as wide apart as possible. It makes it more stable for the pallet to sit on there. And a lot of times, and I would see this all the time, people would get a narrow pallet and they got to move the blades in so they mm -hmm. can pick it up. Then when they go to grab something else, now someone's just not feeling they want to expend the energy to get off and widen those blades. But I'm telling you, the load is just not stable if those blades aren't as wide as they can be. If the load is put on the forklift in a way that shifts in movement and it, it injures an employee, we're looking at an $18,000 citation for not securing loads properly on a forklift. This is very difficult to fight, especially when you have a bunch of boxes like in the picture up there that could possibly just be sitting on a pallet loose. That is the difficulty with it. Yes, the injuring of the employee that goes without saying is a bad deal, but it's very difficult to be able to offend the citation when you do this. When you do pick up a load, you're obviously maximum load capacity, but I know some of those guys pick up, you pick up, you know, metal bars or something or poles that you can pick up and you're kind of balancing. When you're moving something on a forklift, it's got to be secure. Now, what that means is, I'm not saying strap everything down, but I'm saying that you should have complete control over it. And if you were sitting at the end of your seat clenching up every time you move as the load teeters, Brother, that is not secure. You got to rethink that and kind of replace. I like what Rick's saying about the widening of the forks, if that's an issue or whatever. You, you got to make sure that when you pick this guy up, he's as secure as it's going to get. Yep. And as we continue on, you want to make sure that you're tilting the mast backwards to uh -huh. stabilize your load. And if you had any questions, um, and then you want to, you know, check the destination before you place your load. Make sure that you're getting, you're putting it on something that is very stable and square and flat, so that it's, things aren't going to lean. You don't want to place your heavy loads on top of light loads because not only are you going to damage your materials, but when you have that, it, it may hold for a bit, but then all of a sudden things start to teeter and settle, and somebody's walking by, and things are falling over, and you have injuries. Um, again, so it's important to observe the maximum stacking quantities and the orientation when they're printed on the cartons. It's there for a reason. You want to make sure that you're not overloading that stuff so that it could fall and injure somebody. Um, you want to load, know the load bearing capacity of racks or storage shelves. Again, we see a lot of times people have uh, what you, the platforms above offices where the, and you know, so you should have those live load look, signs. Yes, with the, your ele your elevated work platforms where people are actually working or housed underneath. You need to know what those are so the building doesn't call, fall on and crush you. So, Got and the shelving too, Rick. Like exactly. You're about. So it's important to know what those capacities are, and that you know you're reading bills of lading that tell you the weights of the freight and what have you, so that you're making sure that you're within those standards. Got to. People dying too much on forklifts, Rick. So the loading safety. You, uh, again, you want to make sure that you're you're square in position where you're going to load. 
when you're ready to place the load, you then you tilt the mast to a level and tilt it forward only when the load is over the spot where you're actually going to pl place the, the freight down. Lower your, your blades and then back away. Um, and then visually verify that the load is stable. Another thing is, is going in and out of trailers. You get a lot of times at, at docks where you've got trucks coming in there. You want to make sure that, uh, that their, their wheels are chopped and yep. that those trucks aren't going to move so that as you're entering or exiting those trailers that you're not going to have that thing. Uh, seen that happen. The, the, the trucks will push away from the dock and then the forklift falls right off the dock. It's a bad deal, Rick. We've all seen those pictures. Huh? That's a bad deal. Yes. So... You want to make sure that uh, you know, and then also with the uh, the ground that you're on, and sometimes you get these people out in the yard sometimes, and and it's kind of uneven ground and what have you, and so you got to be careful when you're traveling and, and knowing what the surfaces are, and sometimes you get things where they're slick, and it's just important to really know the types of surfaces. What about uh, ramps, Michael? What what you know when you're when you've got heavy loads and you're having to go down ramps? Well, when you go down ramps and you've got a heavy load, you've got to go down backwards, of course. And you've got to make sure before you go down there what, what, what the texture of the ramp is. Some of them are aluminum. Some of them are just flat concrete. There's a lot of slippage going on, and people will slip all the way down this ramp. So when you are doing loading safety, you've got to consider, all right, I'm going to go down this area. It's pretty steep. What's going to happen with this? you really got to think outside the box as you go down there. In the event of one of these bad boys tipping over with you in it, just know this, that the safe place is in the cage. I call it the cage of love. If you stay within the cage of love, you're going to be okay for the most part. But a lot of our problems are with people not wearing their seat belt exactly. and they try to beat the cage. The forklift's here and I'm in it and it starts to tip and they jump out and try to run away and they get caught by that cage. The cage is death. And I'm telling you, you've got to make sure you teach your people that in the event of anything tipping over or this going bad, stay within the cage of love. The cage of love will save us, Rick. That is the safest place to My be. Gosh. You just want to ride it out. Just hang. I mean, you just got to hang on to that steering wheel, brace your feet so that you, you're going to stay in there. And, of course, you're wearing your seatbelt, and that is just literally going to be your best chance of survival is to stay inside that case. Well, I've done lots of OSHA cases, and it is so frustrating to hear somebody that in upper management that thought they would use it a little bit or, or just one of the workers that aren't trained will well, and this thing will catch their leg. It'll sever their leg off. It'll cut their neck. It'll, I mean, it'll snap their neck. It'll break their, their rib cage. This thing, when that cage hits the ground flush, there is no forgiveness in that. No. And that is really something that they need to know, that this thing tips load-wise could really put this thing in an uncomfortable balance. You'll see the bottom right picture that Rick had on the screen a few minutes ago, the triangle of love and the stability triangle basically, and you'll see the pendulum, it does swing. The back is about 8,000. The front can weigh a certain amount, and depending on how heavy that weight is, that pendulum can swing. But forks that move from left to right, the side swing also makes a pendulum swing that way. So if your center of gravity could be off and you're not aware of it, so you really want to make sure you treat that roll cage with all the love you possibly can. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and move on all here right. to pedestrian safety. Michael, when it comes to pedestrians on the dock, who has the right of way? Well, Rick, that is the magic question, isn't it? Who has the right of way on the dock? Let me just say this. If that is your question, you've missed the whole idea of the webinar altogether. One could say it's the pedestrians. One could say it's the forklifts because it's a forklift world out there. I, I have an agreement on both sides, but remember this. If you're asking who's got the right of way, you're, we're, we're missing the point of this. You must, in, you must not teach who has the right of way, but much more, we need to watch out for everybody. I've been in shops that they teach forklifts got a right of way, so pedestrians, you got to watch out. Well, is that assuming the forklift drivers don't have to watch out? That really is insane on some note. It almost gives them a free pass to go a little further, a little faster, maybe not be as uh, detailed as they're coming around corners with that horn honking operation. That, to me, is not the mode you want to teach. And then vice versa, if you teach the pedestrians that they have the right of way, well, then you've got a bunch of people. You know what it's like driving down in a, in a busy city with people walking across the street just assuming cars are going to stop for them. That is the insane process there because 
First of all, somebody who is just a novice in an office or isn't driving a forklift doesn't have the conception of how fast or how slow a forklift can stop. And if they do, that load is it going to fly out and hit the, the pedestrian. So there's so many things happening that the real question has to be is we are we need to watch out for everybody and really stick to that. Yes, and I, I can tell you as someone who walked many miles on the dock, that you really want to employ your cat-like reflexes out there because even though you you know you're training the the operators to be watching where they're going and what have you, um, I know one thing is is if I come in between you know the, the building and and a forklift, I'm going to lose. Mm. So I am not going to rely on that, and I am going to be very perceptive as to what's going on around me. And on more than one occasion, I had to jump out of the way. And, or otherwise would have been crushed. I mean, we've got some basic things here that you want to teach people that are, like Michael said, some, you know, maybe office people who might not be on the dock as often to make sure that, you know, they're making eye contact with the forklift operators so that they're aware that you're there, not to walk across restricted areas and uh, the high traffic areas, not to be walking out there with, with their cell phones or just to rely on what they're, I mean, they've just got to be looking around and being aware. So, and you know, they know that forklifts can't stop suddenly, like Michael mm -hmm. was saying, sometimes you got all that weight, you're not stopping on a dime. You know, they want to stay clear of forklifts that are in motion and again, never pass underneath a load that is elevated by lift, but the most of all, just be aware, be aware, be aware. You just got to constantly be on the lookout. Well, I agree. The gentleman in the top left picture there, you'll see, is walking behind the forklift. And, and that kind of a, an operation can be something that is so easy easy in some respects to do, but you got to make sure that you just don't do it. If you go behind it, you know, like Rick was saying, you got to make eye contact and cut across, but walk around it because that guy very quickly can make an adjustment and go back and he can run over your foot at the very least, if not catch, between a rock and a hard spot. And you'll lose every time. Unless you're the guy from Fantastic Four and you're <laughs> like the rock man from Fantastic Four. All right, training and, certificate and certification. certification. Thank you, Rick. So, all operators, anyone using the forklift at all, if they are driving a forklift, they must be certified every three years. And I like to see them re re receive an annual review uh, every year, Rick. And this annual review is basic, a safety lesson that we put together just to refresh them. The thought that we're only going to talk about forklift safety once every three years is kind of kooky to me. So we put that in there to receive an annual review, and we like that in there because it really just kind of sits everybody down and says, all right, you know what you're doing? Maybe not a driving test, but just a review. Exactly. So the certification, they're kind of doing a driving test every three years, but just a review, making sure they're on top of, of different things, just like all the other issues that you go through in safety. It's just constant short bursts of information to just keep them aware, uh, you know, teaching them and making sure they're aware. And we have a, we have a few different lessons uh, on forklift that you can get out of our library, um, you know, including operating instructions, uh, the differences between automobiles and and the controls, you know, between the the forklift and an automobile, um, steering and maneuvering, forklift attachments, different attachments that yeah. they might use, Tons of the attack. capacity. I mean, these are all lift related topics that that you would look at. Then there's also, of course, the workplace related topics, which would be different surfaces, the yeah. conditions of your facility. You may have areas that are not very well lit, Michael, that may, you know, that may require, you know, some being a little more precautious and, and just, you know, every every place's circumstance is gonna be different. So those are the things that, that you, you want to talk about and make sure that your guys are staying aware of, you know, different hazards that you might have. You might have hazardous chemicals in your in your shop that they need to steer clear of and what have you. So those are those are some of the things there. And I and I tell you that if you if you've certified somebody and they're still driving like a schmuck out there, I would pull their certification and make them go through it again. I know that's probably more work for you, but the reality of it is you got to pull their certification. If they're not wearing their seat belts, you got to pull them off that forklift. When it comes to a forklift certification process and a very safe forklift environment, I've never seen an environment very safe without a very high level of implementing rules and having a disciplinary policy in place. I think you should consider this if you don't have one already. I'm all up for three to five strikes, you're out. 
five warnings, three warnings, whatever it is, as long as the first one isn't one of those verbal statements where we can say verbally you've been a bad boy. I don't like that because that verbal once turns into five verbals and then you got to get up off your butt and write the employee up. We need to hold our management to the fire and, and the employees need to know if you're not following the safety rules, I'm not going to wear your seatbelt, look where you're going, you're going to get written up and you're not going to have a job anymore. So uh, it's an employer's market out there, tons of people looking for a job, uh, let's mind our P's and Q's and not kill each other. And yeah, I mean, a, a, a simple random OSHA mm -hmm. inspection and they see you not wearing your seatbelt, I mean, that's just an automatic citation right there. You're gonna. Get, that's gonna cost you money, Rick. There are a few of you that have been invited to attend this webinar that you may not be a client of EAP. If you are, please give us a call at the 800 number above. We would love to give you a free uh, review of your safety plan and see if we can help you or anything else. Let's move on, brother Rick. Trivia All question right. of the day, Rick. Let's give some lucky man or woman a Green Mountain Grill smoker make their day a little bit better. All right, so. The first person to call, call, call. not type in My on the, gosh, the webinar. Cool. You must call on the 800 number provided with the correct answer. Yes. And you will receive this great Green Mountain Grill. We'll love it. Here's the question. Holy man. How often should forklift inspections be conducted? Oh, Rick, if you make this any easier. Well. So somebody should know. And call us with the correct answer of how often the forklift inspection should be conducted. Rick, I feel like the phone's ringing. It is, and somebody should be answering. But while we're waiting, you can send in some questions, and we'll look at some pictures of some things that you probably ought not be doing with your forklift. First of all, you should never. You are a schmuck forklift driver if you have ever raised a forklift to raise a forklift. Remember that. You are a schmuck forklift guy if you have ever raised a forklift to raise a forklift. You would be a schmuck guy. Next, your child. You should not let little children drive forklifts. That's a little weird, but yes. All right, next. You should never do that either. That looks uh, fake by any means. I, uh, what the heck is that, Rick? I'm not even sure what he's getting into, but he's lifting a forklift to get something inside of a trailer. Are you sure that's not a, a trailer. picture? Uh, I don't even know what it is. It's wrong by many means. There's multiple different ways. And if bombs coming off docks, yeah, just don't lift up bombs. I, that may be what the model of that story is. Jeez Louise. Rick, you got any more pictures? All right. We, we, do have a, we do have a picture here. What the is last this? One? May the forks be with Maybe you. The Rick, forks be you're with killing you. me. You're killing me. <laughs> We're waiting for the answer to come in, everybody, just so you know. We, we, this is what we do at the end. We apologize. And if you guys would be able to get the answer faster, we wouldn't have to wait so dang long. <laughs> it's a pretty easy answer. Let me give you a fork with, and the car. Yeah, let me tell yeah, you. You don't want to lift cars with your forks. You know, it's just not a good idea. Just not a good Steve. idea. Rick, is that the end of it? We are live on a yes. webinar here. All right. We got a do we got an answer to the question? Let's, we've got to have somebody's got to know this. How often do you need to inspect? I'm a little shocked that we don't have an answer from you already. This is all right, Rick. Maybe there's nobody that wants a smoker. Well, it looks like you got something there. This is Michael. Thank goodness, Mary Beth. Uh, here you are. Uh, my name is Michael. Who am I speaking with? This is Michael. Who am I speaking with? Hi, this is Maddie. Hello, Maddie. How are you? Hello, I'm good. Although I'm, I'm watching the webinar. Oh. Yes. Do you have a question? Do you have an answer to the question? Yeah. Is it every shift? Yes, it is. I'm not sure you wanted to, but you just want a Green Mountain Grill smoker. We really appreciate you doing that. Let me put you on hold, and my team will take okay. care of you in a second. Okay, thank you. All right. So, Steve, do we have any questions submitted yet? Yes, we do have a few questions. Okay, great. We have a few people asking for English... Spanish version of the lesson as well as an emailed version of the PowerPoint presentation. 
Yeah, we can email that PowerPoint pre presentation out if, if we can. Rick, Rick, can't we do that? Yeah, we can email the PowerPoint. Uh, the lessons, all of our lessons are available in English and Spanish. On the so Client we, Center? So in the Client Center, we like I said, there's a few different forklift uh, lessons there, and they're all in English and Spanish. What's the next question, Steve the Great? Should you wear a hard hat? driving a forklift. You know, you shouldn't wear a hard hat while you're driving. Well, you can, I guess. Feel free to wear anything you want in, in some respect. But the roll cage is there to protect you. So unless you are working in an environment where there are debris or things that could fall through the roll cage areas and hit you, then you may want to wear a hard hat. But, uh, but more often than not, no, hard hats are not required within a forklift. And with regards to that, another question that may come through, a lot of people will put four cl uh, cardboard over the top or some sort of barrier over the top to save them from the sun. Th this is bad if it's blocking your ability to look up and see the load. So a lot of them will just look forward. But I, you got to be very careful from putting things on top of a forklift to block your view of the surroundings of what's going on. I know a lot of places that will put something on top. I'm never very comfortable with that because it blocks their view. You absolutely don't want to modify the lift up there in any way, welding no. or, or drilling holes. No. It's going to jeopardize the integrity of that cage. I agree. Steve, what's your next question, my friend? Does Cal OSHA require every three years? If so, what section is it in? Uh, the section for every three years, uh, that it says it in the Cal OSHA forklift section. What code it is off the top of my head, I do not know. Steve, if you could uh, tell one of the girls right next to us to uh, in your in your office down there to look up the code real quick, maybe Michelle, and have them uh, post that in the chat session here. That would be great. Okay. What's the next question, Steve? If you have modified forks, who, where can you get the new modified plate sticker with the new modified weight capacity? Well, first, who modified the forks? If you modified the forks, then you just did yourself a disfavor. That's really the problem with it. A lot of guys will punch a hole in the tip of their forklift to get some sort of chain or something to go through. There is none. So if you're modifying it yourself, that's your problem. Nobody knows. You're basically guessing or you're the engineer. So you don't want to modify these things. But when I say that, I know people do all the time. Uh, the problem is if we get caught in a bad circumstance on a defensive scale, we're going to be toast. I mean, it's not going to go well for us. Okay, what's the youngest you can be to get certified? Well, I'd like you to be older than five, and probably younger than 105. So somewhere within that gap. No, seriously, I, I there is no 18 or over requirement. I would assume that you should be around 16 years old to have a driver's license. To me, in my business, I wouldn't let anybody under 18 drive, but that's just me. Uh, I, we don't find in the Cal OSHA code that it says you have to be this age to drive a forklift. The guys up in Northern California who are farmers, my gosh, I know young kids driving tractors all around out there, and they do a pretty darn good job at it. I'm not suggesting I'm an advocate for that, but at the same token, uh, don't look at age. Look at uh, abilities, unless they're five, and you, you may want to look at age. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you you got to be 16 to get a job anyway, so pretty much if, if, if they're able to get a job, like you said, they, you know, if more capability. Try not putting a 16-year-old on there if they're a Yahoo. I mean, that may not be a good choice. What's the next question there? Can I train an employee on the lift without him being certified? Can I train somebody on a lift? You got to train him. I get to, in order to certify him. I'm guessing they're saying so. He hasn't been certified yet. He's got to train him. Is the question? Well, you can train him on the lift without him being certified because you're watching the, the guy. You're you're there watching it. So the not answer is him yes. Loose to work. You're not letting him work. You're going to train him on there. Yes. The answer is yes. Lori, would you tell them that on line two is the lady that's waiting? All right, come and do your magic, Lori. Well, Steve, what's the next question, my friend? Can you put a roof on a roll cage to protect you from the sun or rain? Uh, no, yes. Uh, you can do that under one condition. 
that you can see through whatever you're going to do, but then it would have to be tinted in some fashion. The problem that you have is if you put a roof on top of a for forklift, they would have put a roof on it already if it wasn't for the fact that you've got to look up, and we talked a little bit about that. You've got to look up and see where the load's going up, up above. That, that is really the problem that you have. So if you're going to put a roof on a forklift to block the sun, just know that it's not the way the manufacturer wanted it, and it, there, you're, you're really in a spot that if anything goes wrong, they're going to suggest you allowed that. So I'm, I'm not okay with that. Buy them a big, uh, a big old strawberry hat, you know, a big old farm picking hat, if something like that, if that's what you need to. Okay, are trucks required to chalk their wheels if the dock is on a downgrade? A forklift chalk? Yeah, I would, I would chalk the, uh, the, the wheels. If you're saying, are they required? Is there a Kalisha code? This is if you're for no, there's not a Kalisha code. This is if it's on downgrade, you need to chalk them. But I would chalk the forklift. It's a big machine. If it starts rolling, you got a bad day coming at you. Are closed-toed footwear required while operating a forklift? That is a good question. Yes, closed-toed footwears are required because it would be insane not to have it. And so, uh, yes, yes to your question. put cardboard on the seat because the seat gets too hot. Is it okay? No, it is not okay. The cardboard can slip around on the seat, and you're probably doing that because your seat looks like crap, if you will, and so you need to get a new seat. But if the seat is getting hot, uh, wear some jeans. I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, it is what it is. Park it in a spot where it doesn't get hot. I, that's the best I can give you. Well, you could probably put cardboard over the seat, so you get in, and then when you get in, take it off. I'm okay with that. I'll compromise. That seems to be reasonable, but no, you can't drive with it on there. Okay, they just gave me a post-it with the information that somebody was requiring about the section. Give it to me, Steve. 3668-D2. Cal OSHA, 3 OSHA, 3668-D as in dog, number 2. And 3668F. And 366F is in Frank. Thank you, Steve. All right, we got one last question here. With extended forks, where can you get a new weight capacity sticker? You've got to go to the people who sell the extended forks. Yes. Or the manufacturer of the forklift will usually have extended forks that will come with it. A lot of times you're buying them from some schmuck down the street and you're trying to figure out where you can get one. This really does mess with the load capacity. I'd suggest going to the manufacturers of the forks. I was forks. just going to say that. The manufacturer that makes the, the forklifts usually makes attachments and they're the yeah. best person to go. You got to. Because if I sell you, if I make a, 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 an attachment, I don't know the lift that you're putting it on. So no. to be able to say how it's going to modify your numbers, it makes it very difficult for them. I know this is a hard thing to say, but I would be slow just to be buying random attachments to go on my forklift. Uh, unfortunately, once you have the forklift, it may be an older model. I would be slow to just start throwing mismatch attachments to a forklift. Okay, would Cal OSHA find us if a driver wears high heel shoes? First of all, that is funny. I would say to you probably, improper footwear is a vague code and they can hit you for that all day long. I had a shop that is now has an ocean inspector that is suggesting that because in their shop, their aisleways where the forklift drivers drive through, the aisleways are narrower, uh, they all need steel toe. Now, I, I, I'm going to fight that one, and I need to have a conversation with the district manager, but that's how strong and vague the proper foot protection code is and how they tried to get you there. I'm not saying that's the right choice. I'm just saying i got to have a conversation with the district manager to suggest we all need steel toes because a couple of the aisleways are so narrow where the forklift drives through. I mean, it's, At the very least, I would say it's safe not to recommend wearing high heel shoes to operate the forklift. Yes. Unless they've got nice feet, then uh, you may. No, I'm messing with you. Ah, no, I'm just messing. With you. All right, see what's the next one. That's it. That's it, Steve. All right. All right. Thanks. Listen, I just want to tell you, thank you guys for coming out, Rick. Uh, appreciate you putting these together. If you have any questions or recommendations on what you'd like the next webinar to be on, you may want us to grow more hair. It's going to be difficult for us, or anything like that. We would love to help you. We're trying to give you some free information and get you guys to smoke more meat. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending, and we will see you guys next month. Thanks, Stay guys. safe out there.